Welcome. Like and subscribe for more scary stories. As it turns out, I never had an Uncle Sale. I still remember him, though. Sitting dour at certain family events. Drink always in hand. How's it going, Uncle Sal? I'd ask, thinking he was just lonely and that talking to someone might cheer him up. I'm on the road to nowhere, Jack, he'd say. I never knew how to respond to that. Did I tell him that my name wasn't Jack? Or did I tell him that I was sorry his wife, my aunt, had died? But that tomorrow was another day, in fact, today was another day. And we were all here, having fun and eating good food together. And so there was a reason to feel happy. Of course, it wouldn't have mattered, because he didn't exist. Always sitting there silently, sometimes deigning to validate the adequacy of the turkey dinner when pressed, and always telling me, when I tried to cheer him up, that he was on the road to nowhere. You are too, Jack, he'd say. The last that I or anybody saw of Uncle Sal was 22 years ago, on November 1st, early in the morning, before the sun was even up. I was in the kitchen, rooting through the drawers to find out where my parents had hidden the last of the Halloween candy. Out of the silence, there was suddenly much ado at the front door, a rattling of the knob, followed by a series of bangs which spooked me for a moment, as I recalled images of monsters in the dark from the night before, until a familiar voice called out, for Christ's sake. It's Sal. Let me in. <sighs> a moment later, my dad came into view from upstairs, stark naked, looking as angry as I'd ever seen him. He walked over, pressed his hands against the door, and shouted at Uncle Sal to go home and sleep it off or so help him. Dad, God, open the fucking door. I've got something important to say, and I don't know how much time I've got left. Uh, sleep it off, said Dad again. I was staring right at his hairy ass. It was gross, and I wondered if one day my own ass would grow as hairy. If only I could, said Sal, so quietly that I could barely hear him. Open the damn door, Don. I won't be but a minute. At last, my dad relented, undid the lock, and swung the door open. Still naked, his manhood retreating into him as the cold fall air rushed into our sanctuary. This better be damn good, brother. <sighs> it's damn bad said Sal, stepping inside and seeming somehow to darken our house. Then to me, you might as well hear this too, Jack. No, I'm not Jack, I said in a small voice. Well, and I'm not your uncle, Sal. That's what I came here to say. Uh, my father's anger, I noticed, had not abated. So you got a little high and had to share this great insight with us. Huh? I'll tell you what. You're right. You're not a part of this family. Not anymore. This has been the last straw, barging in here like a maniac. You're nothing now. Bah. That's the exact truth, said Sal, sadly. I heard a noise coming from my closet. It sounded awful, like nails on a chalkboard, you know? It triggers a response inside of you. You can physically feel it sliding into your ears and entering your body, prodding your nerves and making you shiver. Hey. I found that I was suddenly shivering myself. What was it? I asked. It's nonsense, said my dad. And unless your former uncle vacates the property post haste, I'm calling the police to have him removed. When Sal made no move to leave, my father's hairy ass stalked off into the kitchen where the phone was located. I didn't know what it was at first, said Sal, now staring up the staircase, as if he expected something to come down it at any moment. I was too afraid to look. Didn't need anything from the closet, anyway. 
Just a bunch of old memories in there, and dead suits that I had no use for. So I stayed right away. Spent a lot of time at the bar, and when I was drunk enough, I'd stumble home and sleep on the couch. I could still hear it, no. I could still feel it, but it wasn't so bad when I was sloshed and down the hall from it. <sighs> but you did find out what it was? I ask, both eager to know and afraid to know. I heard my father talking into the phone in the kitchen. I did, said Sal. Because, well, it sounds ridiculous now. But I suppose that anything we do seems ridiculous from the right distance. Well, anyway, one night, I was there on the couch, my head swimming in liquor and my bank account dangerously dwindling. And I asked myself, what kind of a man are you afraid of his own goddamn closet? And I resolved then and there that I would stop the noise with my own bare hands. On the surface level, I had to convince myself that it was all just some problem with the pipes behind the wall. But deep down, I knew that wasn't it at all. I could feel it in my cells, my atoms, and after I had foolishly gathered some tools from the garage, the feeling grew stronger with each step I took towards my bedroom. With each decibel that godforsaken noise increased, so too did my dread at facing it. My father returned to where we were standing, by the door, in front of the stairwell. Police are on their way, he said. I'm going to get dressed. <clears throat> Stay a minute, Don. I'm just getting to the point. I was waiting for you. This is the last you'll ever hear from me so another minute won't hurt. I could hear the bed on the floor above us creak, and my mother put her feet on the ground. She plodded off into the bathroom. You've got one minute, said my dad. If the police don't cut you off. Yeah. Good, good, said my uncle. So there I was, tool bag in one hand, doorknob in the other, ready to face whatever was in that closet and I was still shivering on account of the sound. That sound is a warning of what I'm about to tell you if I can cobble together the words. Ma. Sal paused and reached into his coat pocket for a cigarette. You can't smoke in here, said my dad. Arrest me then, said Sal, lighting up. Then he continued. I opened the door and I saw the source of the sound. It was coming from this crack, not a crack in the wall, a crack in what we think of as reality. And it was wide enough where I could see a little bit into it, into what's lying behind what I now understand to be the paper-thin veneer of our reality. And it was crystalline, this intricate, incomprehensible pattern of glimmering blue, many faceted crystals. And then I leaned in to stick my head through the crack. Ah. Uh, Sal took a deep drag and blew the smoke out slowly. My father was as angry as ever. This is the most ridiculous nonsense I've ever heard. Even for you, Sal, this is a new pitch of insanity. I pity you, but the time has come to cut all ties. Mm. As I brought my head nearer, and nearer, said Sal. The noise increased in intensity. I was no longer shivering, but now violently convulsing. My body was doing its damnedest to warn me, but I had to know what it was all about. And so, with my ears bleeding, I stuck my head into the crack. At once, the terror stopped. So, too, did the pain. Now I was looking at reality as it really is controlled by these cold blue crystals. I didn't know if there was a consciousness there, but there was something there, something making it all happen, something experimenting. Again, whether the experiments were deliberate or not was unclear. I felt a will, but if it was a will aimed at a specific purpose or not, I didn't know. Ah, your minute is up, said my dad, just in time. 
Because that's the end of the story. What I discovered is that I don't exist. Not really. Never have. Thus concluding, Sal flicked his cigarette butt out the front door, which was still standing wide open, despite the cold. That's just as good as the truth, said my father. You certainly never did anything with the life you were given. Ah, take care, Don, said Sal. He turned to me. You too, Jack. <clears throat> my name isn't Jack, I said, though I wanted to say so much more. I wanted to ask so many questions, but they wouldn't come to my lips. I could only insist that my name wasn't Jack, though a part of me wondered if it was. Sal turned around and walked out of our house, closing the door behind him, cutting off my view of the creeping red sunrise. It took some time and a great deal of trouble before I understood that my family was not merely pretending that Uncle Saul had never existed to them. He hadn't, nor did I find any physical evidence of his existence, despite digging through long-forgotten photograph in the attic, and even going so far as to bicycle the thirty miles to the house he had bought with my aunt, only to be told by the current owner that she had lived in there for the past twenty years and didn't know anybody by the name of Sal. At first, I was desperate to convince people that Uncle Sal had, in fact, existed. But all I got from my efforts were looks ranging from annoyance to concern, and, more than once, the suggestion that maybe it was time to talk to somebody about all this somebody with a nice couch I could stretch out on, and who knew things about how my mind worked that I myself didn't know. And so, after a while, I decided that there was no point in trying to convince anyone of what I knew to be the truth. It has been easy enough, through the years, to forget about somebody who has universally agreed to have existed. And even easier, I found, to forget about somebody who nobody else remembers ever existing. At most, Uncle Sal would come to mind in a flash, when I would, say, Look over at the old chair in the corner of the dining room where he used to sit and glower during family events. Or, sometimes, I would catch some awful sound that made me shiver a fork scraped across a ceramic plate, for example, and I would think of him and his crack in reality. I remember once asking my high school science teacher, whom I admired a great deal, why certain sounds, like nails on a chalkboard, affected us the way they did? That's an excellent question. I won't pretend to have the answer, but I can offer a hypothesis. Most likely, there was a time in our evolutionary history when reacting with visceral revulsion to such sounds afforded us a greater chance of survival. Say these noises sounded similar to the call of some ancient predator that stalked us in the night. Having an extra sensitivity to these sorts of sounds would help alert us to dangerous presences that meant us harm. On the other hand, this theory is a little too neat. It's entirely possible that there's no good reason at all. That, one day, our ancestors randomly developed this trait and, since it didn't kill them, it stuck around as other more useful traits worked towards our survival. Uh, so nobody really knows? I asked. Mr. Hartley smiled. I'll confess that I'm not an expert on the subject. I'll tell you what, though, Jim. If you want to research this topic and hand in a report on it, I'll give you extra credit. Not that you need it at all, but I truly believe that learning something about the world we live in is its own reward. And frankly, I'm hoping that you take up the challenge so that I might learn something too. I accepted the assignment and researched the topic. At the time, the year 2000, the most authoritative study was done in 1986 when scientists reproduced the sound with a forked garden tool on a chalkboard 
and then separated out the different frequencies contained in it. They found that it was the middle range of pitches that caused feelings of revulsion in the subjects. They concluded, as Mr. Hartley had, that our response to these sounds was likely due to the offending pitches resembling the call of some predator early on in our evolution, such as possibly a certain type of monkey. Now armed with a perfectly rational explanation for why we were repulsed by these sounds, I forgot about Uncle Sal entirely for several years. The world was a place that made sense. It wasn't some bizarre experimental illusion created by cold, alien things lurking behind a sheet of opaque paper. I was quite sure of that. Now, we will skip ahead twenty years through the building of a life that has been, on the whole, quite happy and fulfilling to yesterday afternoon. I returned to my nice house on the outskirts of a small, coastal town where I'd been teaching at a small, well-endowed university. My wife, Alicia, was in her studio, working on a painting. The children, I remembered, were on a play date with friends that would stretch into evening. A perfect opportunity, I thought, for lovemaking. Hey, sweetie, I said, sticking my head into the studio. You up for taking a little break? Maybe have a glass of wine with me? Ah. Uh, Alicia peeked around the canvas. She had red streaks of paint across her forehead, which turned me on. Sure, she said, smiling sweetly. Let me go wash up. <coughs> no, I said. I like it better this way. My wife laughed, and we went down to the kitchen together to select a bottle of wine. Something white, she said. I've seen enough red for today. This piece I'm working on now, it may be the one that does me in. <coughs> Sounds dramatic, I said, picking out a Pinot Grigio and holding up the bottle for approval. Alicia nodded. When do I get to see it? Anyway, I asked, uncorking the bottle. I think it's formed enough now to look like something other than a swirling mess of placenta. So whenever you like. I poured out two glasses full and handed one to Alicia. Hey, she said, before I forget who's Uncle Sal. I froze with the glass of wine inches from my lips. Who? Some guy claiming to be your uncle. Said he's been trying to reach you all day, so he tried my number. He had a message for you that I wrote down. How come you never told me you have an uncle? I became unstuck and swallowed down half the contents of my glass. I don't, I said, thinking about the series of unanswered calls I had received that day from an unknown caller. Must have been a wrong number. Ma. Ah, said Alicia. He did say that the message was for a Jack. But, you know, some people use that as a nickname for James, so I thought that's all it was. The message was quite strange, too. I can't remember what it said for some reason, just that it was strange. It's up in the studio. I shivered. Might as well just toss it in the trash, since, you know, it's not for me. I never had an Uncle Sal, or even knew anybody by the name of Sal. Just a wrong number. Got it, said Alicia. Shall we head upstairs, do the deed? I had grown cold inside and wanted desperately to warm up. We should, I said, topping off my glass. Alicia led the way up the stairs, and I followed from behind, looking at the butt I knew so well, but which still was full of untold wonders for me. But the warm feelings didn't come, and instead I was greeted by the sudden and hideous vision of my father's naked, hairy ass as I had seen it all those years ago. I drained my glass mid-step, only successfully landing half of its contents in my mouth. The rest dribbled down my chin. We reached the second floor and made way to the bedroom. But halfway there, Alicia stopped in front of her studio. 
Want to see it? She asked. The painting? <laughs> yes, I said. I think that by then, I could already hear the sound could feel it reaching into my ears and sliding into my body. Alicia led me into the studio and around to the front of the painting. There on the canvas was a chaotic bunch of dark colors smeared around and on top of each other. And on top of it all, in blood-red paint, some words. They read, You're on the road to nowhere. I dropped my wine glass to the floor as Alicia spoke above the increasing noise. That was the message, she said, from Uncle Sal. <clears throat> I turned to face her in uncomprehending terror as the noise increased in intensity from mere fingernails scraping against a chalkboard to dark and heavy claws tearing through reality itself. Then a crack formed, and Alicia, my love, split down the middle, spilling out a cold blue and screaming the sound. I began jerking violently around, knocking over the canvas, and grew desperate to escape. I obeyed the most powerful, most primitive urge I had ever experienced and ran out of the room and down the hall. I fell down the stairs, banging body parts against the treads and the balusters, but was too full of panic to feel any physical pain. I made it to the front door and outside into the purple twilight and kept running to where my car was parked. I jumped inside and started driving down the road. I drove for many miles, the pain now fully registering throughout my body, and finally pulled into a hotel parking lot. My intention was to drink myself into oblivion and pass out alone in a cheap room, putting off the business of processing what had happened until there was some distance to look at it from. But after a few drinks, my nerves had steadied enough, and I was happy to convince myself that it had just been a strange hallucination all of it from Uncle Saul to the splitting apart of my wife. She was probably home now, I figured, alone with the kids, beginning to grow irritated that I wasn't there yet. The bartender lumbered over to refill my drink. He looked strangely familiar. I held up a finger and said, give me a second. Not sure if I want another one yet. I pulled out my phone and went to call Alicia but I couldn't find her name in my contacts. I bit my lip and dialed her number manually. The line rang and rang. Well, said the bartender, what's it gonna be, Jack? <clears throat> I terminated the call, then pulled out my wallet and placed a $50 bill on the bar top. Keep the change, I said, standing up. And my name's not Jack. It never was. Don't you fucking forget it. <laughs> then I walked out into the cold night. This is the curator. I hope you've enjoyed today's scary story. Until next time. <laughs>